We thank you, Father God, for loving us with an endless love. We thank you there, Lord, that your desire is for each of us to spend eternity with you. And this is your plan, and your plan is perfect. And we pray there, Lord, that as you reveal our next steps, that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us as individuals. We pray for your anointing. We pray for your presence. Fill not just this place, but fill our hearts and minds. Speak truth to us. Drive away darkness. And help us to resonate with your love and be a beacon of light to others. This we pray in the precious and worthy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to start off in history. I want to start off with somebody you, you've heard about, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler and his rise to power in Germany. And in 1930, he was appointed Chancellor of Germany. And then in 1933, under his leadership, he withdrew from the League of Nations and, and in so doing, free Germany to rearm and equip their armies and build up their air forces and advance new technologies. Then in 1938, Hitler annexed Austria. And in the spring of 1939, he annexed Czechoslovakia, and still World War II had not started as yet. But World War II started with the invasion of Poland in the fall of 1939. The German army marched in. Now, it's interesting that the Poles had more men in their army, more men. However, their equipment was outdated. They had few tanks. And in fact, the Polish strategy was to rely on the British and the French to come to their aid and to assist them to repulse any German invasion. And we had these incredible scenes of Polish cavalry charging German tanks they really didn't stand much of a chance. So the invasion started on the 1st of September, 1939. By the 8th of September, the German armies had reached Warsaw. And by the 27th of September, Poland surrendered to Nazi Germany. I'm telling you, this little bit of history to let you know that Poland was totally unprepared for Nazi Germany. Even though they had seen the signs, even though they had seen and heard the rhetoric of Adolf Hitler, even though they had seen the build up of the German army, even though they had seen him annex Austria and then broken a treaty and annex all of Czechoslovakia, even though they're seeing this, all the signs, they were totally unprepared to withstand a German invasion. My brothers and sisters, a storm is coming. Mrs. White says this, a storm is coming, relentless, in its fury, are we prepared to meet it? Now, sometimes people quote Mrs. White and they like to take a sentence out of a paragraph and just quote that sentence. No, this is the whole paragraph. One whole paragraph, one whole four. She wants to drive home one important question. Are we prepared to meet this coming storm? This storm is an attack on our, our liberty. This storm is going to tear away 
our freedoms and leave us destitute. The Bible puts it like this in Revelation 13. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. A situation is coming to us as a people to the whole world where if we stand up for freedom, if we stand up for God and desire to obey the law of God above anything else, we are going to be locked out of the economic system. We will be unable to purchase, unable to buy, unable to negotiate anything or acquire anything, completely locked out of the financial system. It's going to be a terrible time. Mrs. White uses this phrase, abject poverty. Abject poverty. In the great controversy, she says this, the time of trouble such as never was, is soon to open upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess, and which many are too indolent to obtain. Now listen to what she says. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. So you think about some horrific times in the world's history. You think about, um, you think about Nero and what he did to the Christians in Rome. The time of trouble is going to be worse than that. You think about what the, the papacy did during the Dark Ages. The time of trouble is going to be worse than that. You think about the atrocities that occurred during the French Revolution. The time of trouble is worse than that. You think about people like Richard Wormbrand, which Dr. Vine introduced me to, and all that he went through in Nazi Germany and then in the communism. The time of trouble is going to be far worse than what we currently can imagine. Are we prepared to meet it? So during this time of trouble, we're going to need some things. <laughs> we're going to need food, shelter, clothing, health. All our needs, we, we know we're going to have during that time. During that time, we're going to be poor. We're going to need these things. And, and as God-fearing people, we will be praying for these things, for these things. And, and God knows our prayers. God knows what we're going to be answering and asking for. In Ministry of Healing, Mrs. White says this, have confidence in him as a praying as a prayer-hearing, prayer-answering God, he will relieve himself, sorry, he will reveal himself to you as one who can help in every emergency. He who created man, who gave him his wonderful physical, mental, and spiritual faculties, will not withhold that which is necessary to sustain the life he has given. He who has given us his word the leaves of the tree of life, will not withhold from us a knowledge of how to provide food for his needy children. So God is going to provide. And so sometimes the way he provides is by giving us the knowledge of how to sustain ourselves. And we, 
as God-fearing, remnant-minded people, we can rely on the wonderful promises of God. We can rely on the wonderful promises of God, such as in Philippians 4.19, where it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, God does not lie. God cannot lie. And if he says he's going to supply all our needs, he will most definitely supply all our needs. But, but with every promise, there are terms and conditions. Terms and conditions. And we need to be obedient to these terms and conditions. Once we are obedient, we can faithfully ask God to fulfill his promises to us, and he will do because we've learned to be obedient and fulfill the terms and conditions. So, when we think about this time of trouble, what we need is more information. More information. What are we going to go through? And how are we to prepare? And, and what do you want us to do? We need more information. Now, it's a good thing that our God is omnipresent. An omnipresent God is a God who can go into the future and exist in the future, but also be present where you are right now. So right now, our God is in the future, seeing what you're going through in the future during the time of trouble, and he's taking that information and are trying to apply it to your life right now. Our God knows every day of your life. He knows every thought that you are going to think. In fact, he knows every prayer that you're going to pray. And he's hearing your future prayer, prayers you have not prayed as yet. And he's put it into place, circumstances and situations which will mature and come to fruition at the time that you need it. Our God is going to care for you. He's going to look after you. He's going to make sure that you will get through the time of trouble, and be victorious. That is our God. He knows everything and he's going to bring all his power into fruition in our lives so that you can be more than conquerors. So our God who knows the future, who is existing already in the future, is existing now and telling us now a very important message. And that message is this. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. And I heard an, another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that he be not partakers of her sins, and that he receive not of her plagues. Now, we need to ask ourselves a further question now that we've got this advice from God to come out. What does it mean to come out? Now, coming out has a whole new connotation nowadays. I'm not talking about that connotation. I'm talking about coming out spiritually. So our coming out is both a spiritual separation from Babylon in, and her beliefs, it's a mental separation. We do not think our value systems, what we desire to know and aspire to, is different from those people in Babylon. Physically, we are different from Babylon. What we eat, our health, and, and where we live, and how we live is different. And emotionally, we are separate from Babylon. So spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally, we separate ourselves from Babylon and, and the system of Babylon. Now, the, you could preach a whole sermon on any one of these four topics. And we have series that go into details about all of these areas. But right now, let us focus on 
acquiring more information that we need right now. Now, God, who already knows the future, wants to give us this information for our day. And the way that God gave us this information, this detailed information, is through his servant, Ellen G. White. A prophet sent by God with information pertinent to God's remnant people to help them make their way through the time of trouble to finish the work and to welcome God when he comes in the cloud of glory. Mrs. White says this, Ministry of Healing, in God's plan for Israel, every family had a home on the land with sufficient ground for tilling. This would provided both the means and the incentive for a useful, industrious, and self-supporting life. And no devising of human men has ever improved on that plan. To the world's departure from it, it is owing to a large degree the poverty and wretchedness that exists today. So from the very beginning, it was God's plan for man to live off the land in the country. That was God's plan from the very beginning. And no plan, no human plan has ever improved on that plan. And but so all we need to do is learn to trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. If you learn to trust God's leading, trust God's advice, take it and apply it to your life, then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Furthermore, Mrs. White says in Ministry of Healing, page 200, he who fed the multitude with five loaves and two small fishes is able today to give us the fruit of our labor. He who said to the fishers of Galilee, let down your net for a draft, and who, as they obeyed, filled their nets till they broke, desires his people to see in this an evidence of what he will do for them today. And not just today, but in the future. If we obey, hold on to his promises, trust God, he will provide. He will provide. Now, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, was challenged to believe. He was challenged to believe. And he decided to do it. He was confronted by a huge Midianite army and men from the east, and they surrounded Jerusalem, and he, and he didn't know what to do. So he called a time of prayer and fasting. And then a prophet stood up and told him, you will not need to fight in this battle. The battle is not yours, it's the Lord. And then the very next morning, Jehoshaphat decided to trust God and obey. And he rallied his people together and he said this to them in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20. And they arose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and he inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established. Believe his prophets, so shall he prosper. So if you can believe God, believe in God, trust in God, act upon his promises, you will be established. That's going to be your foundation on which to build. And for you to prosper now, to excel and to achieve more, you need to believe the prophets that God has said. Mrs. White says this, The mountains and hills are changing. The earth is waxing old like a garment. But the blessings of God, which spreads for his people a table in the wilderness, will never cease. So God is able to provide for us tables even in the 
wilderness. He's able to provide food for us. Now, when we are told to trust in the prophet, and so shall we prosper, and we know that Mrs. White, Ellen G. White, is our prophet, is the prophet for these last stage, she has got a wonderful book that we all should become very, very familiar with when it comes to country living. And the title of that book is Country Living. And we need to take this book and read it from cover to cover and apply it to our lives. We need to take the advice which God has sent to us via her pen and apply it to our life. And when you read that book, you realize that country living has numerous benefits. First of all, country living helps to develop your character. And we know that character is the only thing that we're going to take from this earth into eternity. And country living is a wonderful uh, way of developing strong Christ-like character. Country living also helps you provide for your needs because when you cannot buy, you can't rush down to Walmart or to another retailer, you can provide for your own food by growing it in your gardens. Country living is a great place for your mission and can serve as an outpost from which you can reach your communities. You reach your neighbors, reach your friends and those around you. They can come and see your lifestyle and think, wow, this is incredible, and learn more about the way that God wants us to live and be impressed and hopefully choose Jesus Christ. And also, when we are in the country, God gives us these country properties in order for us to prepare for others. Because we know that during the loud cry, there are many people, many sheep who are currently in the world. God is going to bring them out of the world during the loud cry. And they will, when they come, they're going to come with little and nothing. You know what the World Economic Forum says? By the year 2030, you'll, be, you'll own nothing and be happy. <laughs> So when they come, they're going to come with nothing. They're going to need food. They're going to need shelter. They're going to need a place to, a place to sleep, a community to connect with. So as you th are thinking about your country property, don't just think about yourself and your nuclear family. Think about the hundreds that could possibly join you on your country property as well. And God will help you provide for those as well. And of course, living in the country is better for your health, for your mental well-being. Living in the city is a crazy place to live, to raise children, to, to be able to free, free, think freely and to connect with God. It's difficult in the city. And, and the country is a wonderful place to Wake up early in the morning, breathe that fresh air, and just commune with God in nature. So there's benefits in country living, and you can read more about that in the book, in the book Country Living. Mrs. White says this, darkness before the dawn, when, God's, when God sends to men warnings so important that they are represented as proclaimed by holy angels flying in the midst of heaven, he requires every person endowed with reasoning powers to heed the message. The message. So we're talking about the three angel message, which is the heart of Seventh-day Adventism. Now, the three angel message is a very great message that we're going to take to the world and to the, to the church. Now, the three angel message is not just spoken. The three angels message is a lifestyle. It's how we live. In fact, you can apply the 80-20 rule to this. The message that we are given is 80% how we live and 20% what we say. What we say is enhanced and given credit and importance and power by how we live. 
when you think about the early church and how the early church prospered and grew and thrived, it wasn't necessarily about people teaching doctrines that impressed them and caused so many to join the early church in the hundreds and thousands. It was how they lived as a community that impressed them. And they thought, whatever you're teaching, I'm believing because I can see the evidence of what you're teaching in your lifestyles. The same is going to happen in the last days. God's remnant people are going to be living this three angels message. This three angels message. And this message is going to um, invigorate and excite people in the world. And they're going to leave their world, leave their loved ones and families, and come and join God's remnant people. Now, I know some people kind of question whether this is going to happen. And some people say, well, in their opinion, the Sunday law may not happen just as Mrs. White says it's going to happen. I've got a quote for people who question God's prophet. She says this, we should not allow any human argument to turn us away from a thorough investigation of Bible truth. Human opinions and customs are not to be received as of divine authority. We must not be influenced from the truth as it is in Jesus, because great and professedly good people urge their ideas above the plain statements of the word of God. So even though somebody may have an opinion, say, oh, well, you know, the Sunday law this and the Sunday law may not happen. I'm here to tell you, trust God and trust his prophet. In Adventist Home, she says this, before the overflowing score shall come upon the dwellers of the earth, the Lord calls upon all who are Israelites indeed to prepare for that event. Let me just hold on a second. Let's pause there. So if you are truly remnant-minded, truly God's people, you will indeed prepare for that event. To parents, he sends a warning cry. Gather your children into your own houses. Gather them away from those who are disregarding the commandments of God, who are teaching and practicing evil. Then she says this, get out of the large cities as fast as possible. As fast as possible. Now, as you go through Mrs. White's statements and as she goes um, up to the Sunday law crisis and then even after the Sunday law crisis in her day, her focus, her, her urgency uh, of her message gets more and more intense, more and more intense. In the book Country Living, page 9, again and again the Lord has instructed that our people or to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. We should now begin to heed the instructions given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you'll be free from the interference of enemies. Once again, the message, get out, and the urgency, get out, do it quickly. In Adventist Home, 373, educate our people to get out of the cities into the country. So as a group of leaders, we need to be encouraging our members not to dwell in the cities, not to build institutions in the cities, but to develop them in the country. Get, educate our people to get out of the cities into the country where they can obtain a small piece of land and make a home for themselves and their children. Another one. 
The Lord has sent us warning and counsels to get out of the cities. Then let us make no more investments in the cities. Fathers and mothers, how do you regard the souls of your children? Are you preparing the members of your family for translation into the heavenly courts? And in Country Living, page 17, if we place ourselves under objectionable influences, can we expect God to work a miracle to undo the results of our wrong course? So if we're living in the city, we're going to be subjected to the uh, mentality and, and the vice and the crime and the influence of the city is going to have an impact on our lives. Just as much as Sodom influence Lot's thinking. It's going to. And God cannot protect you from it when you're surrounded by it 24-7. No, indeed. So instead, get out of the cities as soon as possible and purchase a little piece of land where you can have a garden, where your children can watch the flowers growing and learn from them lessons of simplicity and purity. Once again, the time factor is also mentioned here. As soon as possible, do not delay. When you can, I can bring up quote after quote after quote after quote with the same message. Get out the cities, get out the cities, get into the country, get a, get a piece of land, grow your own provisions. Numerous quotes. To summarize it all, God's remnant people live in the country. God's remnant people live in the country. So as we get into the last days, the very last days, we will find that God's people are living in the country and not in the city. So my advice to you is, my, is from the, taken from the very words of Jesus found in John 13, when he said this, what that thou doest, do quickly. If you're going to do it, do it quickly. Don't delay. Don't delay. Do it quickly. Now, there's been some pushback as of late about country living and, and why we should move to the country. And people are saying that, you know, don't worry about it. God will provide for you in the cities and God's going to look after you in the cities and, and don't worry about it. He's going, to just, he's going to provide. And they take one particular quote of Mrs. White, just one, and they, um, they add their interpretation to it. So let us take that quote and fully understand it because we know that with the word of God and whatever God message he sends, they all have to be in harmony across the board. So let's look at that quote. And I'm going to read the entire paragraph. It's a fairly long paragraph, just to show you that I'm not going to cut anything out. This is what she says. For two years past, the Lord has shown me in vision repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal months in the time of trouble. And that's the quote they'd like to take. I saw that if the saints have food laid up by them or in the fields in a time of trouble when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it will be taken from them by violent hand and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God and he will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water will be sure at that time and we should not lack or suffer Hunger, it continues. The Lord has shown me that some of his children would fear when they see the price of food rising and they would buy food and lay it by for the time of trouble. Then in a time of need, I saw them go to their food and look at it and it had bread worms and was full of living creatures and not fit for use. So that's a quote. So let us see if we can bring this quote into harmony with everything else she says about 
country live in. And to do that, we actually need to look at our chronological chart of last day events. So we're, during this, we're at the latest seeing stage, the shaking stage as it starts to intensify. Okay? So it's kind of small. So let me zoom in on the part that is particularly relevant to us. So this is the part. So you see there's two types of timers of trouble. There's a little time of trouble and the great time of trouble. And these two are separated by the general close of probation and the death decree, which occurs at that time. So prior to the death decree, prior to the general close of probation, is a little time of trouble. During the little time of trouble, we are delivering the loud cry. This is the last warning call to the world, to encouraging people to come out and join the remnant people. Okay? And we finish, when we finish that work, God, Jesus throws down the censer and he stands up in the holies of holies, leaves the most holy place, and that's a general close of probation. Death decree happens at that time. Also at that time, the plagues start to fall. The plagues start to fall. So, when Mrs. White is talking about it, she says this. And we look at what she says. When sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land. So when she refers to the time of trouble, she's referring to that phase of the time of trouble. So during the, after the general close of probation, after Jesus stood up and the death decree is, is issued, that's the time when sword, famine, and pestilence in the land, we cannot plan for that phase. In fact, Mrs. White tells us, angels will tell us where to go. Angels will lead us and guide us at that stage. And the angels will bring us together into small companies and scatter us around in mountains and, and desolate places. And it's at that time that God will provide for our every need. But prior to that time, God will provide, but he's going to provide for us as we are living in the country as we are living the lifestyle, because we are demonstrating to the world that there is an alternative way of living. And we are not hid away, hiding in the mountains. We are living in the country, demonstrating to the world that this is a better way of life. So when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, during the great time of trouble, it will be, that's the time when it will be useless to plan and say, well, I'm going to have a, a stash of food over there, and during that time I'll go over there and I'll get my resources. No, we cannot plan for that time. We have to wholly trust in God during the great time of trouble. Our bread and water is sure. It's going to be sure when we have to flee to the mountains and to the wilderness, when we have to run f during those times. So, we're in 2024. It's a new year, beginning of a new year. Typically, people like to uh, coin a phrase around the year, the year of the dragon, or the year of the woman, or the year of something. I would like us to take 2024 as a year of preparation. The year of preparation. And the way I want you to think about it is this. What if this is your last year to prepare? How would you live your life? Where do you want to be if this was your last year to prepare? And in 2025, all mayhem broke loose and it all kicked in and it all started in 2025. If this was your last year to prepare, what would you be doing? How would you be living? What would you do? How would you invest your time, money, and energy? What would you be doing if this was your last year? And that's a very important question. What to do now, how do I apply the, the advice, the counsel from God to move to the country in my time? 
What do I do with this information? The, the requirement, the request, the advice is there. Trust God, move to the country. Even though you may not know how it's going to work out, we need to learn to trust God. So what do we do? The first thing is this. You've got to learn to recognize, hear the voice of God. God has to speak to you individually. You cannot be running to Pastor Kelly or Pastor Vine and say, Pastor, what do I do? What do I do? Should I do this? Should I do that? No, you need to hear from God yourself. You need to know the voice of God for yourself so that he can direct you and lead you. Because sometimes the voice of man can be confusing and can complicate things. You need to be sure because when God tells you something, you can trust it. When you heard God speak to you and he told you to buy this property or to move here or to start this industry, you can be sure that it's going to be a success because God told you. So you need to learn the voice of God. The second thing you need to become aware of and familiar with is the advice from Sister White. You need to read Country Living, read through the testimonies, Read Adventist Home, Ministry of Healing. Become very familiar with her work and get all her advice, which cannot be put into one sermon. Read it for yourself. Understand it for yourself. Now, her advice is different from human advice because she's a prophet from God. Now, human advice has some benefits if you're looking at things from a human point of view. For example, there's a book called Strategic Relocation. Okay, now this is a great book and it tells people what to look for when you move into a country. Make sure you're not near a pig farm or make sure you're not near an a, 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 a army base or a nuclear facility or stuff like that. Okay, it's some great advice, some great advice, certain places where you should avoid. Okay, low lying flan, like don't be in Florida. Oh, that's me. <laughs> but, but. God's advice is different, and God can tell you to go to a particular place because he knows that he has a plan to keep you safe in that place. It may be a place where other people say, oh, that's a crazy place to go. But if God tells you to go, then you need to go. The other good thing about reading Mrs. White's writing is that it sets you out as a person who's developing an outpost in the country, okay? We're not building a compound like Waco, okay? We are not doomsday preppers, okay? Our philosophy is completely different. We're developing outposts for where God can reach to the world through our living, through our demonstration. Okay, so we're not preppers bunking down with ammo and guns and we'll shoot anybody who comes close. No, that's not our mentality. We want the world to come and experience God's goodness in our country outposts. The third thing is this. You need to make country living your number one priority. Your number one your priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added unto you. Once you put God, his plan, his mission, his kingdom first, then everything else is going to suddenly start fitting into place. You couldn't imagine it before, but somehow it all works together well when you put God's plan first. And for you to do it effectively, you will find that it consumes all your life. It becomes everything. Your whole lifestyle changes. Your priorities changes. And that becomes your number one priority. Let me read you this. Satan will, if possible, prevent them from attaining a preparation to stand in that day. So that's the plan of Satan. The plan of Satan is to keep you unprepared because if you're not prepared for the time of trouble, when it comes as an overwhelming surprise, 
you will be taken in and swept away. Satan will, if possible, prevent them from attaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, entangle them with earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, wearisome burden that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life, and the day of trial may come upon them as a thief. Satan will keep you busy. So you have to be intentional about leaving the cares of this world to one side and putting God first. And trusting that when you put God first, he will also manage your cares as well. He's going to provide for all your needs. He knows that, but he needs you to put him first. Satan says, says, no, worry about this because these are important. Once you, and you know life, once you, go, once you sort out one situation, another fire. Once you manage that fire, another, and then another, and then another. That's how Satan operates. He will keep you busy. And time just ticks away. And before we know it, the Sunday law is here. The fourth thing we need to do is we need to connect with like-minded people. We need to go to events and conventions like Adagra or other conventions like um, I, my, me, myself, we were in a ministry, wildernesssurvivalcamp.com, and we put together camp meetings where people who are interested in leaving the cities come together, connect, learn, encourage each other, develop new skills, and go back infused and excited about the course. They develop their missionary skills. They help to learn about how to start their small businesses. They learn a host of things. You need to connect with other people who are thinking and moving like that. Sometimes in your church, you can feel like you're the only one who has this urgency. Sometimes you can feel like you're alone in your church with this desire and this passion. And you think, why isn't the whole of the church thinking like this? Don't be discouraged. There are other people out there all over the world. God is doing incredible work even now around the world, South Africa, Ecuador, Australia, New Zealand, Kenya, Uganda. You, people are calling and, and asking, how do we do this? How do we do this? All over the world. So God is moving. You just need to start to connect with camp meetings or conventions or, or weekends where this topic is being talked about and where this information is being shared. So I encourage you to go to our website, Wilderness Survival Camp, with, for some events. You see, God has a plan, a plan for your life, a plan for you. And, and God's plan is arranged in a way that you will make it. You will make it. He knows each day of your life. He knows what you're going to go through, what you're going to face. And he's going to provide for all that you need. And he's going to answer your prayers. God has a plan for your life. And that's because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you so much, he does not want you to fail. He loves you so much, he wants to see you succeed. But part of that plan is move to the country. All God's remnant people live in the country. It's my encouragement to you, God's encouragement to you, to heed this advice now, to take it seriously, to protect yourself from the, from the um, oppression that's going to come as a result of the Sunday law and your liberties and freedom being stripped away from you. It's my advice for you to take the advice now, and to move your families out of the cities 
to the countries. And if you're already in the country, please start making sure that you're planting your trees, developing your gardens, getting your alternative energy, becoming independent so that you can survive during those final few days, weeks or months on Earth. To be aware of new videos like this one, be sure to subscribe to the Preparing for the Time of Trouble channel. For more free videos and downloadable audio podcasts, as well as handouts, go to www.preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com. Topic categories include recordings of live seminar presentations, country living, sustainable gardening, homestead remedies, how to be self-sufficient when the grid goes down, wild edible and medicinal plants, hydrotherapy, and end-time Bible prophecies. To take advantage of these free resources, go to preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com.